Perfect. Thank you, Ali. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. As you know, the landscape of drug use is always changing and evolving, and so must our policies if we're to respond to the impact on individuals, families and communities. As we move away from the concept of the so-called war on drugs and we continue to turn our attention to providing appropriate and adequate supports to the people that are most impacted, this must be re also reflected in our policies. And our national drug strategy is appropriately named Reduce and Harm Support and Recovery, a health-led response to drug and alcohol use. However, it goes without saying that services have to be adequately resourced if they're to implement a health-led response. And policies can be slow to catch up in, on our increase in knowledge and understanding of the drugs issue and the role that trauma and disadvantage play in communities that are disproportionately impacted by the negative consequences of drug use. And for more than a decade, Tala and Whitechurch in Tala and Whitechurch that our uh, task force covers, there has been an increase in drug use and no increase whatsoever in the overall budget that's uh, allocated to the projects. The staff teams and the managers consistently are working creatively with what they've got to respond to people's needs. Crack cocaine, as you all know, is at an all time high in our communities and there's no medical substitute. There's no med medical intervention for for crack cocaine in the same way that methadone can treat opiate dependency. So more time and more resources are required to support individuals to look at their options in relation to their drug use. So this evening, we are very, very grateful to six exceptional leaders who not only work tirelessly to support those who are most disadvantaged and vulnerable in our communities, but they're also advocating for and influencing changes in national policy, both here and in the UK. And they will tell us about the most up-to-date progressions in the approaches we can take to substance use. So I really hope that you all take away some interesting insights tonight. Um, and I really, I know it's outside of working hours. So uh, your time is really appreciated, especially on a sunny evening in June as well. So thank you. I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Marie Oppebowen. Marie is a consultant psychiatrist. She's the co-founder and CEO at Karma Ireland. Karma is a community-based counselling and peer support service for people with coexisting addiction and mental health issues. It's based in Tipperary. And Marie is going to speak to us this evening about trauma and dual diagnosis. I'll just um, share my slides here. Well, I don't exactly have a lot of slides, so <laughs> try not to anyway. So thanks a million. I know we don't have much time and obviously this is a topic that is, um, I'm very, very passionate about, as I know the other speakers are too. So it's, it's hard to sort of uh, try and, and, and squeeze it into a very short time span because these are huge, huge topics and we could be we could be here forever talking about. But um, but anyways, um, yeah, so so I'll just dive in really. Um, uh, you know, so dual diagnosis, I guess, starting off, you know, you're already without starting, you know, we, we hit an obstacle in terms of the terminology that is being used, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And um, dual diagnosis, I guess, loosely uh, is loosely defined as the coexistence of addiction and mental health issues. Um, however, it has a lot of different definitions and um, a lot of different uh, terminology being used to define uh, the coexistence of addiction and mental health issues, whether it's severe enduring mental illness or um, mental health issues or um, uh, substance misuse issues or um, co uh, coexisting or co comorbidities or yeah, it, it, the list goes on. But um, I guess the difficulty around the word dual diagnosis is also around uh, the duality of it, implying that it's it's you know two difficulties or two problems, uh, which you know we all know. I guess um, the, these issues are incredibly complex, and most people present with a whole multitude of, of things. So that's not uh, quite accurate. And also the diagnosis 
diagnosis part of it is around, you know, a lot of um, it, it sort of implies that you have to have a diagnosis in order to access services or access any supports. It also it implies very, I guess, a, a sort of medicalized uh, model, um, which, you know, if if using that sort of definition, um, you know, we, we kind of exclude a lot of people who end up who, who typically would be the ones falling between the cracks um, in our services. So, so yeah, we prefer kind of a loose, loose definition of it, but it also has implications for when you talk about how prevalent dual diagnosis is or how, how common, you know, addiction and mental health issues or the coexistence of that is. Um, you know, so if you, if you use a very narrow definition, obviously the prevalence is not gonna be that, um, that high, but by and large, I think all sort of prevalence studies around are, are probably more likely to be in under uh, estimation uh, than than accurate um, figures, so we we generally tend to um, to go by um, by the, the the figures of around forty five percent of people attending mental health service had uh, experienced some addiction issues in the past year, and around as much as 85 percent in in um, uh, uh, drug and alcohol services would have had um, experiences of mental health the difficulties in the past year so that's a huge 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 amount of of, of people and clearly a very um difficult to say that you know that um, addiction and mental health uh, issues are two separate things and um, and it obviously um it has diagnostic challenges in terms of for clinicians to try and establish um what what you know someone's presenting with whether it is an addiction issue or a, um, a mental health issue as you all know they present very similar and the chicken or the egg situation is is, is difficult to uh, establish but um just wanted to just mention as well that a lot of people that i come across anyways i guess um, maybe think that dual diagnosis is an actual diagnosis, a formal diagnosis, which, um, which just to say that it it isn't, it isn't, it doesn't is not included in our um, diagnostic manuals. As, um, as a psychiatrist, going by the the likes of ICD or or DSM, so just to to clarify that, it's still quite you know separate. So. Um, so yeah, so we all know that and have worked with people with um, quite significant addiction and mental health issues, I'm sure. Um, we know that um, it, it causes a lot of um, challenges for service providers and obviously for uh, for the individuals um, experiencing um, both. So, um, so what we do know is that people with dual diagnosis have a um, higher rate of relapse. So typically, um, typically because um, services fail to um, attend or meet people's needs when it comes to addressing um, both the addiction and the mental health in an in, in integrated um, holistic way and, and, and only deal with one or the other, um, that, uh, that tends to um, leads to people relapsing so typically when getting into you know or we can become abstinent from substances you know your your uh, mental health issues tend to deteriorate as you've probably been using substances to cope with your mental health issues um which would probably be the most typical i guess presentation in the um among our services or among you know in, in the mental health services and also in the organization that i work in so, um, you know, I guess it's the sort of self um, self medication sort of model. Um, so we yeah, are. So we have a higher rate of of relapse. We, you know, people with dual diagnosis have. Um, a higher rate of hospitalization it would usually take longer for people to get into recovery or to um, progress. Um, they would have a higher risk of um, homelessness, high risk of um, uh, deliberate self harm and suicide, and also high risk of being victims and perpetrators of violence. So, um, so we clearly know, and it's very clearly established, the the, the negative outcomes of not treating uh, dual diagnosis in an integrated way, of or not meeting these people's needs. We know that people with dual diagnosis are the most high risk people that uh, we come across. Uh, yet we are, are 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 not very much further in terms of actually being able to meet uh, people's needs. So, um, so I guess um, part of that, from a psychiatric point of view, is um, is because we we have tended to um, to ignore the role of trauma um, in 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 it all. I guess for me, it's very much the common you know common denominator, and it it makes sense to you know to understand um, trauma and its effect. You know, it, it affects that it has on on um, or 
adverse childhood experiences would have on an individual um, when it comes to the way they present and their and their risk of developing uh, both addiction and mental health issues. Um, it, it is much, you know, when you understand the role of, of trauma, it's very, it's impossible to, to sort of like separate, you know, one part of an individual from the other part of an individual. So, um, so you know, we know a one in six people have experienced um, uh, four or more adverse childhood experiences, um, which are, you know, things like, you know, obviously physical, mental or sexual abuse, uh, but as well as, as um, you know, growing up with a family member with, with mental health issues or a family member with addiction issues, uh, domestic violence and um, losses, separation and um, um, things like that. So, um, so yeah, it's... Um, it's certainly um, it certainly is changing. Our increased awareness and understanding of that is changing. And I guess the way policy is is forming and developing. And um, you know, if there's one thing that has been very much uh, clear for you know over twenty years, you know, in terms of policy, is that integrated care is needed. You know, the, to address addiction and mental health to get together is is very much uh, what's been advocated for for many many years. But however, it it doesn't say how how we're going to do that or how you're supposed to do that. And um, and that's why we're here. All these years later still talking about the same things we were probably you know all those years ago but um but that's why i'm i'm glad to see things are changing a little bit and in terms of from the mental health service perspective i just wanted to touch on the, the couple of the different relevant uh, policies that are um, um relevant to dual diagnosis and i guess the first time um uh, that dual diagnosis was mentioned in mental health policy would have been would have been in the vision for change um, in uh, 2006. Uh, that was our national mental health um, policy then, and um, it 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 advocated for a sort of specialised services around addiction, and mental health, or around dual diagnosis. Um, the problem with the vision for change was that. Uh, there was no implementation plan or um, um, around it and um, and obviously all the funding that came along was supposed to come along with progressing the, the policy you know of, um, um, disappeared in the in the crash so anyways uh, we then had also connecting for life which is our national suicide prevention strategy which obviously highlights dual diagnosis as one of the um, major um, a risk risks and, and needing to address that and around the same time that that came out was also the establishment of the uh, what we call a clinical program in dual diagnosis which uh, which is one of the hse's ways of addressing kind of significant issues within the mental health services um and a a program that was supposed to be rolled out in the country to sort of address dual diagnosis was was um the, the work on that was sort of started around 2016 17. Uh, however that work has kind of fallen away and um, a lot of obstacles which means that that is it's not um it's not um, being um, it's not completed yet so um but connecting for life very much supports you know their the solution is to is, is to support the um implementation of that particular clinical program so they're very much hanging on to that and the reducing harm support and recovery uh policy is also very much relying on the the existence of the clinical program for dual diagnosis and with the outcome of that um and um um, and you have the likes of Slauncher Care also mentioning uh, dual diagnosis and very much obviously promoting integrated care um, in, in all sorts of ways in terms of reforming our health services in general, because obviously an integrated care is, is needed for a lot of various challenges. But, um, but what's promising, I guess, in terms of mental health uh, reform has previously been around turning our services into becoming more what we call recovery oriented and very much taking more the service user, um, uh, you know, in the center of, um, you know, decision making, etc. And, um, and more community based services. Um, but sharing the vision, which is, is, is taken over for a vision for change from last year. Um, a, you know, in that policy, we hear the words trauma-informed care mentioned for the first time. And in my opinion, then, I guess, uh, recovery-oriented and trauma-informed care, I guess, is, is, the, is the sort of uh, common denominator that I, I think has the potential to, to, to pull together both addiction and mental health services and provide more integrated care. Because once services across the board are um, become more trauma-informed, um, they 
you know, I, people will fare better and it, it, it will be easier to um, to provide integrated uh, care. And, uh, and I guess um, you have the um, No Wrong Door uh, bill, which is currently, I'm not exactly sure exactly where it is in the door, but um, it certainly is another, um, I guess, uh, uh, hopefully uh, bill by law that will will um, make it impossible for for services to to exclude people on the grounds of uh, of either um, you know their addiction or the mental health issues that that people would be responded to wherever wherever they present within our system so um so yeah so so karma which stands for connection on recovery and mental health the the um is a charity that um we set up in in nina and tipperary and it's um it very much um it, we, we might aspire to um to be uh, fully trauma informed as an organization and you know from the get-go and from our initial uh, development so we, we provide uh, counseling and peer support and very much easy to access low threshold care um uh, with with uh, with peer support is, is really at the center of, of what we deliver alongside professional uh, supports that are integrated um, uh, you know, we're very much early, early days and we opened our doors in 2019. So, um, so yeah, you know, we, we certainly um, hope to see uh, more um, integrated care being possible and certainly more, more peer support happening, um, which, which is key, but it's still, um, you know, I think in, in terms of actually being able to respond better to, um, to people's needs across the board, you know, there is no one one solution or one uh, way of doing it and creating specialized services is 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 certainly not our vision. Uh, you know, we very much hope that there wouldn't be need for dual diagnosis services, you know, if, if we all had a better understanding in, uh, of addiction and mental health issues and the role uh, of trauma in that. So, um, yeah, I guess that's that's probably me. I'm probably gone over time, have I? Not at all, maybe. Good. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's great, Marie. Thank you very much for that presentation and congratulations on the opening of Karma in Tipperary. Hopefully we will see many services like Karma rolled out across the country. Um, the need is most definitely there and well done you leaving you know, the HSE as a consultant psychiatrist to set up a community-based project. Um, it's admirable and we need more, more, more Marie's. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. The increased awareness of understanding and understanding of the role in tra of trauma in addiction is so important. And I think what you said there about being trauma informed is essential. And if communities as a whole could be trauma informed from, you know, social workers right across to the police um, to people working in the services, um, it would be absolutely fantastic. There is a huge correlation between trauma and addiction. So that needs to be taken into consideration when we're responding. Um, and somebody in the chat box, a couple of people actually mentioned Dr. Gabor Mate, and I know Marie is a fan of his work too. So if anybody would like to look up more information on trauma and addiction, Gabor Mate is a good person to Google. But Marie, thank you so much and best of luck, continued success with Karma. Thank you. So next we have um, the fantastic Anna Quigley, um, Anna is the coordinator at Citywide Drug Crisis Campaign. Citywide, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, supports community groups, projects and activists working locally on drugs issues. And Anna is going to talk to us about community development. Thanks, Anna. Oh, my God, I feel like uh, leaving the room after an introduction like that, Niamh. But, um, <laughs> thanks a million for your kind words. Um, and just, just to say, yeah, no, th again, thanks so much for, for the invitation to be here tonight. Brilliant speakers, um, a, a, a whole load of brilliant speakers here tonight. So, um, okay, why is my, my Annie, you could, could you try, if you put your cursor over the screen, do the little arrows come up in the bottom left corner? No, my... No. Oh, yes, yes, it does. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. so you can yes, do so. Yes, great. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 
uh, this hour of the evening. Great. Listen, thanks, Ali. Panic over. OK, um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about basically is the community development approach, um, which uh, I'm making the case that community development approach is a health led approach to drugs policy. And when we're talking about health led approach, I mean, it's very simple, really. We're talking about moving from the policies that are based on stigma and moral judgment, sanctions, punishment um, to policies that are based on improving the quality of people's lives and actually addressing the inequalities that impact on their lives. And it's like, a, um, you know, it, the, the approach, the pr approach of punishment and sanctions, we know that reinforces inequality. So in fact, we're, we're making things worse rather than addressing the underlying issues by using those policies. So we need to move um, to what, what, what is we would see as a health-led approach. So I want to just talk a bit about how um, a community development approach can contribute to this. So I suppose the first, um, the first point I want to make is that obviously what we bring is our community expertise. And we do have a lot of us because we are old. We've been doing this for 40 years. Um, and I know there are people who say, you know, that we've been saying the same things for 40 years, but actually that isn't true at all because we have done incredible learning in the community. Basically what community expertise is, it's the experience of what it is like to live with the impact of drugs and addiction. And it affects the person who's using the drugs, it affects their families and it affects the community. And um, it's that that experience is expertise. And again, um, this is this is going back to originally when and, and, and some people may remember this in the 90s and um, when communities became involved looking at the issue of drug supply in their areas and wanting to do something about it even at this stage this this was this was about the community coming together that's how community thought they were coming together to support each other and even at this stage when there was such a focus on drug dealing people were there was a really clear message to this street campaign people might remember which was um addicts we care pushers beware so there was already a message coming through that people wanted to look after people who, who had addiction um, and there were a lot of families also involved in in these kind of public meetings and again you see here the the, the women and the mothers who were who were involved in them um, in in as part of that street campaign as well but again this is where i want to talk about the learning because it, be, it began to as this this was this was uh, an approach that people thought would work but then the learning people started to look at it and realize okay um addicts we care pushers beware and then began to realize well hang on they're often the same people because people who are using drugs sell drugs and um, people also began to realize and families began to realize what families need is support that it could turn into a situation where they were being blamed for someone in their family using drugs rather than being supported and um, so there was a real recognition then I think within the community that the, the people who use drugs the families they needed their own voice um, and they needed their own networks um, and we're very supportive of those networks being set up and their voices um, coming through and again it's bringing the community together it's not separately it's not dividing it's not setting you know the broad Broader community against families against uh, people using drugs it's it's very much together and a, a further learning on that over the years has been as we, we've come to realize that there are minority communities within our own community who are affected in particular ways so we we will work very much with our partners and um, in the traveler community through pavi point in other ethnic minority communities through new communities partnership in the lgbti community through belong to and it's really important we're all seeing as being part of the community together and that's been a key learning but also you know i think we've we've not just learned from our own experience we've learned a huge amount from the experience of others again sometimes people say we think we know everything no we do not we know very very little and we always need to learn from others and from the evidence and i think there's a couple of really good examples of how this has worked over the years the first one i think is very much about you know the change in drugs i mean obviously this this kind of community and uh, um, activism started around the, the, the heroin issue but obviously over time, different drugs. Remember 2003, we began to hear about cocaine use in our communities. Then we went and we went over to our really good friends in Liverpool, had a, a, a brilliant conference in Anfield of all places, I'm not a Liverpool fan, um, and learned from them about their experience. And again, in 2008, when we began to see crack for the first time, the learning we'd gotten from, from our friends over there was hugely important to us. 2004, I think in Ballymun, the community there started to look at um, the problem with benzodiazepine and here is a new problem of what was a legally a drug that was legally available starting to cause problems in in, in the community again i remember to 2000 um 
2014 and um, very strong um, messages coming from communities and very strong responses at local level to through task forces to to we the fact that the the, the kind of we that was available now was was much higher than and that at higher strength and people needed to be more more aware of that and um, so all, all the time and it's interesting the learning there was a lot of learning about yet yeah, these are different drugs and and they act in different ways so the the, the specific drugs were sometimes changing but again, I think part of our learning was the underlying issues were not changing and we weren't actually addressing the underlying issues, which was an interesting learning and still the case. The other thing I think really interesting learning was, again, um, and somebody once said this, it was like going from being an activist to a manager. A lot of people who were involved as activists in the early days became managers or began to work in our community drug projects. And so, again, they were involved in actually delivering services, supporting people, um, you know, to make progress and move on in their lives. And they began to look at and say, what do we do? in here like we're putting all this effort and um, in, in our communities into supporting people but in our society we still um give them the message that effectively because they use drugs they are a criminal and we began to see those two things are completely opposite at, at opposites with, with each other and they don't work and um, so we've got to look at you know why why are we making criminals out of people because they use drugs or because they have addiction and again generally that would be a huge change i suppose in our perspective is is, is starting to see that that kind of sanction is it only makes things worse and again evidence we went to to our friends in london neve and release and the hrb as well produced the evidence show us that in fact you know that, that the, the conclusions we were reaching um were, were right um and that that it was it, it didn't make sense to be to be criminalizing people when we wanted to support them and had the opposite effect and we know not absolutely everybody in our community networks is is in agreement with that but at this stage we think the you know the vast majority see that 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 stuff makes sense so this community expertise where where do we bring it and, and we bring it to the drug and alcohol task forces and to the national committee that's there we have these structures whether it's the community reps and the task forces whether it's the community drug projects but to say very clearly um what we need now is for it to be much more clearly recognized as expertise and um, we have work to do in citywide around that but at national level and um, there really is a huge need um for greater recognition it's it's not there to you know we'd have to say to the extent it used to be um that this is expertise that communities have and uh, then i'm moving on this is and i just like showing pictures you know um this i suppose this picture is from uh it, it basically looking at the second point is after the community expertise is the whole um that we can build on the community engagement and interagency partnership and the previous picture was about um our history learning from our experience and again it was you know back in the 80s and um, there was a, 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 an initial the concerned parents against drugs was a community campaign that was very focused on 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 reading our communities of the supply of drugs um, and then in the 90s, the street campaign that we've seen there started all over again. But there were quite a number of the community leaders looking at that and say, well, here we are 10 years, years later and we're having to do the same things all over again. And it was a realisation that oh, we as communities are not responsible for solving this problem because we didn't create it. And we turned to the people who did have responsibility, the statutory agencies and the politicians and said, you have to do your job. So in effect, it was the community that approached the state bodies and said, you come on board with us as partners, the, the, the actual model for the town forces with the interagency project in the north inner city which was set up at a community invitation so very much from the very beginning communities have recognized we can't do this on our own we want people to be on board with us as partners and we'll do it better that way and um, but partnership again and particularly now we have to say what it is you know it's something that we use the word a lot but a lot of the time it, it, it isn't um what it you know what it says on the tin and the key thing about i mean one very good example really quickly is back in 2008 i mentioned that at that time there was a concern about crack cocaine becoming an issue and there was a really quick response that the, the national drug strategy team at the time engaged with the national advisory committee on drugs brought together a committee which included all of the sectors included the community looked at the issue what do we need to do how do we respond 
came up with a very good report, you know, so that we were ready to deal with the issue. Now, it didn't develop into a huge issue at that stage, but we just contrast that now. I mean, we know in 2019 in Ballymun, they did a fantastic report on what's happening in their area around crack cocaine and came up with a whole series of solutions. Nothing happening with that. I know in Tallow recently, I heard a really good piece, people from the project speaking really clearly about the impact of crack cocaine in, in communities all, all over the place. That issue has been raised, but we're not getting the response. And the thing about partnership, it is it partnership yeah part of it is sitting around the table and being part of the discussion the key thing is you have to be part of the decision making as well if you are not part of the decision making then it isn't partnership and again it's back where should this happen this should happen again at the task forces and the national committees but it can only work if those task forces and committees are actually the place where the decisions get made so you know, over recent years, we would be clear that more decisions are made somewhere else and not here. And we need to see the decisions being made again in, in the places where communities are represented. And um, Neve made reference earlier to, to the community drug projects funded through the task forces. Um, and again, this is very much about a community development approach to delivering services. And we think this is so important that the the, the strength of these projects and what they do, it just really is not properly recognized or acknowledged because they do extraordinary work. Like they, they're per perfectly um, suited to, to deliver an interagency approach because they can range across all of the statutory functions. If somebody comes into them, they don't have to say, well, I can't deal with your housing or I can't deal with your family issue or I can't deal with your legal. They can deal whatever the issues are that impact on people's lives, they can deal with. They can adapt and respond to whatever the changing needs in the local community are. They have a flexibility the statutory agencies can't have. And really crucially, this thing of supporting reintegration back into the community, because we know sometimes that there can be a lot of tension in communities between, uh, you know, from people who, ha who have been involved in, in, in drug use and sales in the past. And, and then it's about working with the community so that there's a greater understanding um, amongst the general community of, of the drugs issue. So it's a crucially important um, uh, approach. And again, it was recognised in, in when the department did its analysis of the impact of COVID last year. One of the case, a couple of the case studies on on the projects, and it came out really, really clearly how well positioned they were to adapt um, when this situation came in and to keep a level of services going. And um, so we really need to, first of all, we need to support their work, obviously, by, you know, but by, by having greater recognition, again, particularly at a national level about how important their work is. And um, but also you've made this point about resourcing. And these are just a couple of pictures. You can see the names of the projects there. Um, these are all these are particular campaigns that have gone on and they've gone on for years now around the issue of inadequate funding and the, the failure ever to restore the funding that was taken away years ago. Sorry, I've gone one too far. And this brings me to this point, which is absolutely crucial, because what you saw there is, is an example, I suppose, of advocacy and lobbying. It's a core part of the community development approach to advocate and lobby. It's not an optional extra. Like this is the government's own community development policy and um, says, you know, that it's part of our role to ensure the voice of communities is heard in relation to policies and decisions that affect them. And um, so it's an essential part of the engagement process in the drugs issue. If you think of it, if we're involved in identifying needs, and we're involved in working with our partners to come up with, you know, this is something we could do. We know most, a lot of the time, there aren't resources sitting there. Nobody's sitting there with money to say, here you go. We know that. We all accept that. So that's when we have to go and advocate. Just because there isn't a pool of money there doesn't mean we go away and say, oh, well, sure, forget it. We have to go and advocate. That's what we've always done. And it's essential that we do that. Um, and you know, it's it's and again, as it says that that is part of the role of the task forces to um, in their terms of reference. But I suppose the really important point here is that if you give people a voice, if you give the community a voice, um, you, you have to listen to what they say and you shouldn't try to silence them if they say things that you don't want to hear. And the lobbying role should be supported and seen as a core part of, of, of what we're about, because in the end of the day, that is about trying to improve things. That is the reason for doing it. Um, and it, it's essential that that is recognized. <coughs> and and uh, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah. And it's it's it will be true to say at the moment, it's it's not recognized. I think that the right to advocate and lobby is 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 uh, not recognized to, at all to the extent it needs to be. Um, and I suppose just in, in um, 
in finishing up, this is, uh, <laughs> I'm just showing off anyway that we get the president to come to our meetings, you know. He's not in the shop because the best crowd shot I could get was was where his name was. He's at the other end. Um, but yeah, this is this this is what it's all about. This is a, a conference we had in Crow Park. Um, and it's the room was full of, it was everybody, people from communities, people from task forces, people from statutory agencies, just everybody was there. We were listening to speakers who spoke. We had speakers coming from abroad to speak about um, the, their situations, to speak about, you know, the, the broader kind of um, drugs policy um, uh, reform issues. We had, we had a speaker from Ishka and Surya talking about the experience of people using drugs. So uh, people listened and responded and, and, and came up with, with, with their, you know, with their, their ideas. And, and again, it did very much advocacy because as well as the president, um, we, the minister was there as well. And it was very much about advocacy and putting out the, the, the messages from it. So that's, com that's community development in action and um, hearing, giving our people, you know, people an opportunity for their voices to be heard and um, but coming together and, and, and doing it in partnership. And um, so I suppose in conclusion, um, yeah, it's it's really essential that, you know, and we've seen the role of the, through the slides, I've, I've talked about the role of the task forces and the national committee. We do have the expertise between all of us. We do have the structures there, but what we really need now is kind of leadership at a national level to, to make those structures work so that we're actually building on and benefit, benefiting from the massive expertise that is out there. Um, and, we're, and, and sometimes just and, and just to say, like it's 25 years this year since the start of the task forces and the rabbit report and all that. And, you know, it's often said to us that we keep looking backwards. We're not saying these things because we want to look backwards. We're saying these things because we want to look forwards and we want to move towards that real head led approach, which is about addressing um, people's quality of life and the underlying issues that affect it. And we think we have a massive amount to contribute to that in partnership with everybody else. That sounds a bit pompous there at the end, but anyway, so that's me. Um, thanks, Ali. That's all. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much, Anna. That was um, fantastic, and it was great to you know get back to the roots of where this all started and how um, projects like yourselves and all of the community-based projects that are based around the country kind of started. Um, it was from the ground up. It was a grassroots approach. And although I couldn't agree more that the amount of work that's done on the ground in communities by communities is amazing. It's outstanding given the limited resources that they have available to them. So you're right, it is, it's our policy makers, our government and the statutory agencies that we need to, we need them to hear us so that they can, you know, respond with appropriate policy or funding. Um, but thank you so much, Anna, that was, Super fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, so next we have Dr. John Collins. And wait, you hear this for a title. Um, <laughs> Dr. John Collins is the Director of Academic Engagement at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and specializes in drug policy and um, speaking to government, uh, particularly in the UK and all over Europe. I'll, I'll let him say a bit more about that. But he's going to speak to us this evening about a human-centred public health approach to the drugs issue. So thank you so much, John. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Neve, and, and thanks to Senator, Senator Ryan for, for the invitation to be part of this tonight and, and to all of my panellists as well. And uh, thank you, Ali, as well. Um, no, it, it's a real pleasure to be to be speaking here tonight. Um, it's been a couple of years now since I've been back in Dublin, largely because of the pandemic. So it's nice to uh, it's nice to, to kind of get a, a feeling of being back home and to hear some familiar voices. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been asked to speak about, um, I think, a broader kind of international picture on drug policy. And I've been uh, lucky through my work to have experience of working in other countries and, and, and to work in a lot of different contexts on drug policy. Um, very different, right? Uh, I, I've, I've worked in drug policy in Burma. I've worked in drug policy in Colombia. I've worked in drug policy in Dublin, right? These are very, very different contexts. Um, 
in terms of what the state can provide, in terms of what sort of services are available. And sorry, by the way, if, if I sound a bit nasally, it's because of hay fever. I haven't got a cold or, or anything else like that. So for, so forgive me if I'm a little bit uh, lethargic and nasally. But um, yeah, so the, you you get to see, I think, when you when you work in these different contexts, I think some some similarities um, uh, that, that really permeate across this issue. And, and I think it really militates. What, what I often hear when I go to, when I'm, when I'm working in various places is, uh, well, this is different, right? Uh, uh, Burma is different. Brazil is different. Uh, we have to pursue this kind of policy. And then within countries, you, you hear the same thing, right? Rio is different than Sao Paulo. Um, and actually, what, what you find when you drill into the issue a little bit is, it's not really, we're, we're talking about the same things, right? We're talking about the same issues around um, exactly like uh, Marie was saying about these issues of trauma and the same underlying factors, which result in certain people um, being have, for, through difficult life circumstances, ending up kind of falling through the cracks of the system or developing substance dependence issues or and 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 struggling to struggling to relate to society or whatever it is because of those issues. And, and society then, choosing various approaches with how to deal with these people. And I think this is exactly what we're all speaking here tonight. I know there's some really great expertise on the call here tonight. And I'm not trying to, to say that I have any greater insights on the Dublin, Dublin situation than anywhere else or than anyone else, because I know people have been working this for years and decades on this call. So, so I'm just going to maybe just try to give a, a couple of kind of key takeaways from my own thoughts of having worked on this issue. Um, just to say a little bit about my organization. So I actually started in drug policy, I think about 15 years ago. Um, and I started a unit at the London School of Economics, which was called the International Drug Policy Unit. And it was really about this issue about how do we make international drug policy better? And, and this was a very different time, right? Neve said it in her opening remarks, like we're, we're in this kind of post-war on drugs era now. I, I don't go to many meetings or I don't zoom into many meetings where people are advocating for a return to war on drug policies or hardline policies. They, they have been pretty broadly um, rejected, I think, at, at, at the international level. But back in 2009, 2010, that wasn't the case, right? And you, I, I, we all know this. A lot of uh, we, we all have experienced this. And, and um, this has been a, a pretty rapidly changing policy sphere. 2010, 2011, 2012, it was almost breakneck how quickly it changed. I, I knew people who were working in the field since the 70s and the 80s, and they said that they always felt the wind was in their faces when they were trying to push for a change in rhetoric or a change in approach to this. And then suddenly 2009, 2010, 2011 hit, and you saw momentum building internationally for a kind of reevaluation of policies. And uh, um, we, we saw that Anna was pointing to the citywide conference, I believe it was 2017 or 2018, I, I can't remember the date, um, but that was really in, that was part of that momentum that there was this kind of international discussion happening and there were a lot of groupings coming together trying to share experiences about, about what actually works. And just to say currently, my, my current role is I, I, I coordinate academic engagements for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. We're a network of 500 experts from around the world. We have a core secretariat of 75 people spread all over the world as well. And really our approach is to create a global network to counter organized crime networks. And I know that sounds much more organized crime focused and not really public health and human centered approach to drugs. But, but I, I would say my organization takes a very, very community oriented approach to these kind of issues. We focus a lot on issues about you cannot have an approach to organized crime or illicit economies or drug dependence or whatever it is, unless you've got resilient communities, unless you're investing in communities, unless you've got communities that are able through civil society engagement to, to really uh, represent themselves and to, to support themselves on these issues. Um, so just to give some opening points, um, the, the idea of a war on drugs has been well covered, right? It, it's not a new idea. And, and we come to this again and again, when, when some outrage happens, when there's some gangland shooting or when there's a new drug emerges on the scene, we tend to see the same response, right? We need to get tough. This is dangerous. This is new. Um, why, why, why are the police not doing more? Whatever it is. And to just say that we have seen this for two centuries now, uh, again and again and again uh, in various contexts, right? We think of the opium wars in China. We think of the cocaine wars in Colombia. We think of the current war on drugs in the Philippines. We think of the 40, 50 year war on drugs in the United States now. Um, and, and the same motivations are always there and the same outcomes are always there. They don't work. 
right? And we know this, and we've experienced this in a Dublin context as well now. Um, it's the, and, and it's the same impetus that we, we need to do something and we need to aggressively do something. Um, so, so we've learned lessons from this, I think, from these, from these repeated experiences. And I think the first lesson we've learned is the war in, uh, an idea of a war on drugs just fails on its own goals, right? And, and we have oodles of experience of this from the international level. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll cite UN data in a minute, but what, the one thing we can say for certain is despite the war on drugs, despite the hundreds of billions that have been, trillions, frankly, that have been spent globally on this, uh, drug markets are still growing and they're likely to continue growing. And this is despite a deeply repressive, militarized war on drugs enforcement centric approach. And if that doesn't give us pause to reevaluate, I'm not sure what will, right? When we keep doing something, but it's not actually achieving the end point, you need to look for, you need to look at alternatives. And I think these have been, these have been well outlined by the speakers already. Um, if we look at the irrationalities that accompany a war on drugs or drug policies up until quite recently, there was again legion right so many irrationalities that were just facially nonsensical right uh, locking people into a cycle of criminalization rather than enabling them to get into support services um that's one example um you know i can think of a more extreme one if, if you go to the philippines um and, and just going out and murdering people uh because they're associated with or somebody claims that they're a drug user right the, the, these are the extremes that we do see at the international level if we look at the course of the current policy i mentioned it already but there's uh, years ago, there was a very solid analysis by a think tank in the US, and they basically estimated from the 1970s, the US had spent a trillion dollars on the war on drugs. You think of the opportunity cost, you think of what that money could have been spent on, and you think of the cost to communities of you know, mass incarceration, the racial implications of all of this, the gendered implications of all of this. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really huge thing. So there's the direct, the direct cost, what's, what governments spend on it. But then there's the social cost, which we haven't even really begun to be able to quantify. And then lastly, on that point, the disproportionalities. What we see time again is, and I'm, a, I'm a historian of drug policy. That's what I've studied. That's what I've done more, first and foremost before I got into policy. Um, if there's one thing you want to know, if there's one thing that, that summarizes drug policy over the centuries, it's, uh, it's never about the drugs themselves, it's always about who's perceived to use the drugs, right? If you want to understand how policies develop or, or how they're implemented in a lot of, in, in most cases, uh, particularly if you look at somewhere like, let me, let me moan about the US, right? If you look at the US, uh, it was the perceptions of who, what, particularly what racial groups were perceived to use, what, what class groups were perceived to use drugs determined the responses, right? The crack cocaine wars of the 1980s in, in, in New York had a very different flavor from the current opioid uh, crises in the US because of who was perceived to be at, at, at using them, right? This is, I don't think this is even a particularly disputable point. There was a hard, tough on crime, militarized approach in the 1980s. We have a much more health oriented approach now. So I think, I, I think that is just something that's worth acknowledging. But if we look at the current trends and where we are, um, as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has said, over the last two decades, drug markets have both expanded and diversified. Um, Drug use is rising, overall numbers of consumers are, rise, are, are rising, but also the proportion of the world's population who consume drugs are rising. Um, all indicators, so therefore all indicators suggest that the global drug market is expanding. And again, this is despite the current policy. Um, I, 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 I'd like to think of another policy area where we'd be trying something and it's so visibly not working and then we, the response is, well, let's do more of it or let's just continue on on the same path. Um, we, we can see that mass urbanization is a key driver, and this is something that countries around the world experience, that uh, drug prevalence is significantly higher in our urban areas over rural ones. Um, rising wealth is, is, is a is, goes hand in hand with increased drug consumption, um, but also that drug use disorders are disproportionately borne by, by poorer communities, right? So this is something, again, we see around the world. Um, we've also seen the rapid prol proliferation of new drugs, and some of the other speakers have talked about this. Um, although this trend at least seems to be stabilizing to some degree, and Ireland was one of the early adopters, or had one of the earliest policy experiences, let me put it that way, of, of the MPS phenomenon. So what do we know at this point after decades and frankly centuries of doing this? You can't win a war against a social problem. Um, and, and we know that in very many areas, but drugs is a particular one where we have plenty of evidence on this now. Um, the failure of the war on drugs hasn't been from a lack of trying. I, I, I shouldn't have to say that, but some people do argue that. But it's, it's not because we haven't tried. You know, the U.S. has tried to incarcerate its way out, incarcerate its way out of it. Uh, many countries have tried to 
eradicate uh, drug production or, or transit through very militarized repressive approaches, it hasn't worked. So what we can say at a pretty substantive level and substantial level is supply, supply focused policies, policies focused on we will eradicate the drug problem by er interdicting supply. Actually, I'll just say, I notice I'm talking quite fast. I get in trouble for this a lot, but I think on a Dublin audience, I can actually get away with it. I've had translators and, and others uh, sending me messages while I talk to please slow down. I don't think that's an issue here, but anyway. Um, so no, you're good, John, you're good. Good, good. Um, so yeah, and the supplies and the supply, you know, this focus on if we can just eradicate supply, well, then the drug problem will go away. That has not worked. And we don't have any real evidence. And I mean, I mean, this really, we don't have any real substantial evidence bar if we look at um, the, the very tumultuous period during communist China in the 1950s or Afghanistan in the 2000s. Other than some very specific cases, we don't have cases internationally where a policing oriented supply interdictionist approach substantially changed drug markets. And we have to recognize that fact. And that means that police, of course, have a role. And I think the Guardi have, have, a, have a, a, a clear strategic role in a lot of this, but they can't be the only response. And we can't be putting all this response, uh, the, the, the view that they should be solving this because they don't have the ability to. It's a, I, I don't have I obviously won't go into it, but there's an entire political economy of drug markets which can't be stopped just by enforcement. Um, and then what I would say is on the public health oriented policies, um, uh, on, on the areas that they have uh, they have been tried and, and used, they have been, the, it, it's sort of, I'd say, it's they've done what they said on the tin, right? Uh, harm reduction, social services, treatment, um, broad public health oriented policies have reduced uh, bloodborne transmission have reduced harm in myriad ways. Have succeeded in 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 pe helping people on various stages of reducing harm or recovery or however they they want they they, they engage with it. And we have to acknowledge that that uh, we have this area of drug policy. It doesn't solve everything, um, but it it has it has delivered on what it said it was going to do. And I think we have to acknowledge that even now. It's it's something we we need to kind of say out loud. Um, and that leads us to this point is nothing will solve it, right? It's, it's one of these global problems and there's lots of them, right? Poverty, uh, inequality, we, we, we can strive to improve them, but they'll always be with us to some degree, unless we get, yeah, they will always be with us. So I, I'm not a utopian, right? We're not, I don't see a time when we're gonna get, escape these things. And the attempt to, have, to find a one size fits all solution for these policies as the war on drugs was in the past, I think is ultimately where a lot of the problems come from. Um, so what we can do is, I think, uh, ultimately, and it's not a, we can do this and it will solve the problem, but we can aim to better manage, it, ma manage the issue. Th this idea of a whole of society response, which recognizes you can't arrest your way out of the problem, that all social services, including the Gaudi, have an important point in, 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 in engaging and managing the issue, um, that you focus on social services. Um, a whole of person response to this. And then and, and instead of just focusing on the drug use factors, I know this is preaching to the converted, I think, to a lot of people on this call, but uh, it, it bears saying anyway. Um, on the policy responses that I would recommend and that I would recommend, frankly, regardless of wherever I was giving this talk, um, uh, it's de deprioritizing low level involvement, right? This is not, this should not really be a policing issue. What we can say from a research vantage point, and Anna was speaking of it, de decriminalization of drug use where it has been tried has been very extensively researched, has been very thoroughly evaluated, um, and it's been justified. It, it, we don't see countries that move towards decriminalization aiming really substantially to move back from it, right? The Portuguese experiment, as far as any experiment that I've come across in drug policy, it worked, right? It, it, it worked because it was alongside a whole series of social service interventions. But all of the worst case scenarios about if you decriminalize low level consumption, you're gonna get all of these social problems. They just didn't materialize. And, and when that's the case, I think that's, you know, it's a, there's a moral imperative to change policy when the evidence around a policy changes. Um, the, the, the strategic use of policing to tackle organized crime, and that's really where my organization uh, focuses, uh, to tackle issues around intimidation, to strengthen community resilience. And one of the things we, we, we talk about is this idea of asymmetric policing, right? You use a strategic, you, you don't send the police in and think that they're going to destroy the Dublin drug market. 
but they can certainly manage it and they can make it that the harms of the drug market are diminished and that the community experience of the drug market is diminished. And that's just recognizing the realities of limited police time, limited police resources and all of these other issues. So you focus on quality of life issues and, and, and how the drug markets interact with the community rather than having this goal of our aim is to totally eradicate the drug issue or the drug problem. And then, of course, focusing on these broad spectrum service provision issues. Um, uh, you know, low threshold uh, uh, services, housing, health, welfare, th those sorts of things. Okay, I, I, I couldn't, <laughs> I thought it would be a nice way to end. I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum. I'm going to go to Colombia, where I, I like, I just like to show these photos. It was years ago, I was there, but uh, I like to show these photos anyway, where you can see where we talk about cocaine and crack cocaine, but to see the communities that are involved in that as well and to put a human face on it. So this is a place called Putumayo in, in Colombia. It's a it's pretty ravaged place in terms of the conflict over the last few decades. Um, very remote. So, you know, a two-hour flight from Bogota, then you take a two-hour drive on a dirt road. The road ends, you get in a boat, you drive two hours upriver, right? There's no, there's no real sense of this being connected to the broader state. Right, it's 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 a land on its own in in, in the rainforests of Colombia, and this is the these are the fields. Now they said this was a field that was sprayed by glyphosate, which is a weed killer that they sprayed to kill coca crops. I'm not sure they may have been it may have been slash and burn to just clear land that they would grow more coca in. Um, and this this is an example of a coca plant that that they grow there, and I, there was fields of it. You could see it. Um, but this is this is meeting with the community. Some of these members, some some of these. People were members of FARC. Um, like FARC knew we were there. And it, it, this was not an area that the government controlled. And some of these guys had killer capture orders on them. But the real sense that you got when you met with these community members was um, the sense of the, the state being a foreign entity, right? It's, it's, it's almost an en enemy entity because the state doesn't provide hospitals or nutritional services or schools or anything like that. The community provides that themselves. The state provides a military which comes in and rips up their crops, arrests them or potentially kills some of them. Um, and so this is this is the issue that you face when you when you're somewhere like Colombia. And I've, I've, I've worked a lot in Colombia over the years. and It's a it's a really difficult case. And you've got a, a we know this from the Northern Ireland context, right? A peace process, uh, very fragile community relations, all of these long standing animosities that are trying to be healed in a relatively short period of time. And people say, well, why can't these farmers just stop growing coca, right? We have to transition now. This is a criminal economy. We need to move beyond it. And when you go to these areas, the first thing you realize is, what else are they going to do, right? There's no other crop that they can get to market. They don't even have roads in these areas. It's too expensive. So they grow coca because it's the only thing that sustains them in these areas. And then it's a case of what do they know of the state? How are they going to integrate with the state, which all they know of it is the military, Right. So so how do you have to go in there and you have to start building social services and you have to build hospitals and homes and all these sorts of things. And that takes years. And in the interim, there's no solution. There's no immediate solution where these people can suddenly stop doing what they're doing. And this just I think is just to highlight how complicated this is as a global issue. Um, the, the country that has been most successful in using development, which is I think Colombia was trying to for years to move away from uh, opium cultivation, was Thailand. Right, Colombia is obviously cocaine, but Thailand was very successful with opium. That took decades, right? That took decades of the government spending huge amounts of money on infrastructure and, and training the local communities and really making a priority of this. And um, this does not go away in, in a year or two. So that's that's the supply side. So when we get frustrated on the demand side in Dublin, also just to know that it's also extremely complicated upstream as well. So anyway, that's that's it for me. A real pleasure to be here, and yeah, looking forward to the discussions. Wow, that was um, that was fantastic, John. Thank you so much. Real food for thought there. Um, I love your quote. You can't win a war against a social problem. Um, I'm definitely gonna rob that and use it sometime in the future. Um, and I like your kind of concept about not being utopian. Um, and I think that's difficult to accept, but we must accept that. You know, as long as there is demand for drugs, there's gonna be drugs and I think it's so interesting to see the flip side the up the stream as you say and the complicated probably disadvantaged um circumstances that those people are living in as well I mean I hadn't actually thought of that before so that was definitely new learning for me and I really appreciate it and um, thank you so so much that was absolutely brilliant and I'm also glad it's recorded because I need to go back and, and and listen to it again so thanks for that John cheers um, Next up, 
I hope everyone's still hanging on in there. Um, I know I'm conscious we don't have a break, but we've got a couple more speakers to go. So um, if anybody does need to grab a glass of water and you want to turn off your video and do that, that's fine. Feel free and um, just make sure you come back. So next we have Jason Q. Um, Jason is Chief Inspector of the Thames Valley Police. He has 33 years policing experience in the UK and is known for protecting and reducing harm to people that are most vulnerable and marginalised. And Jason's going to talk to us this evening about drug diversion and also about naloxone. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Neve. Uh, Ali, are we good for the video? Yeah, great. Let me just bring that up. Perfect. Thank you. A mess left in the house. Floorboards, door frames, the 14 trophies from his days of ice hockey. And I replayed in my head everything that was done and said. It was always us and them. I said dad and they said just one more broken man. I said help. I'd seen a bell around his arm after school one day. They said someone will take you away if they find out he's a junkie. I said I think it's getting worse and maybe one day soon. The hospital beds are full, they said, of birth and mothers wailing, the old are frail. And I asked, what's the point in keeping warm our young and old if the lives in between are left in the cold? And they said there comes a day where men in this country deserve the blame for their own pain. You should have taken responsibility. You should have kept up the ice hockey. I said I could see the illness tearing him down. I said I see it in his eyes. You wouldn't see it on a brain scan. It hides behind the man. He can't fight it or bear it. You can't tear it down to a statistic. And if you stepped into his shoes, you'd lose your footing too. They said there's a hundred other pairs of shoes for him to choose from. And my voice was dying, but I raised it to say, he doesn't have the choice. He's a poet and the world will never know it. He's a superhero with a fear of flying. He's in pain with a fear of crying. A runner without a field. He's a sculptor with no clay to wield. He's a fighter without a ring. A singer singing with the acoustics of a prison. He loves me and I love him, and he said, it's a tough one. I whispered, I think we're going to lose him soon, to an empty room. He'd stopped answering. I was too late to find the fix for my broken man. And I wonder how many other kids in Britain are left to clean up the mess of helplessness. Floorboards, door frames, and the 14 trophies from his days of ice hockey. I replayed in my head everything that was done and said. It was always us and them. But it's just us in the end. Uh, thank you, Ali. I'll just share my screen now uh, if that comes off. Um, I just want to say good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, it, it's a bit of an own goal showing that video right at the beginning because it always makes my throat wobble. And, and there's genuine reason for that because that video is full of stigma. It's, it's tragic. It's full of trauma. But what, what it essentially shows you is the state, if you like, ganging up the system ganging up people who live uh, with addiction or in particular families who have to live with addiction hidden within their families because they don't have the means to to, to seek support so in this case reese uh, lived with her dad who suffered with uh, an addiction and uh, slowly that took hold of him uh, to a life-threatening stage but reese obviously being at school couldn't seek help for fear of being taken away from her dad and knowing what the consequence would be ultimately and her dad couldn't seek help uh, for you know for his own um, addiction for fear of losing his daughter 
And that that just cannot be right in today's society. You know, for any other health matter, you would have a whole host of options available to that family to help them through, you know, what what is essentially a health matter. Yet we 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 police, we medicalize addiction completely differently. Um, so uh, whilst I share this, I'll do a very brief introduction because I want to save on time. Um, but my name is Jason Keogh. I'm, I'm a, a chief inspector with Thames Valley Police, and um, I've been a police officer for 26 years, actually. I don't know where 33 came from. I'm not that old, <laughs> but um, uh, I know I might look it, but um, but each that that's a long time nonetheless. And, um, and what it's shown me is that uh, drugs is uh, is equal throughout all society. Um, yet we over police uh, in inequality uh, more um, um, dis and disproportionately more more disadvantaged communities than any other. And there are lots of theories, academic theories around this, but we basically police the most densely populated areas. So those in the most affluent areas take lockdown for as an example. Um, you didn't see many rich people get. Uh, lockdown fines for having parties in their houses because no one saw it but yet if people uh, smoked uh, drugs outside of their block of flats in a more densely over police population they were the ones that over criminalized and drugs is exactly the same um, so this infographic here I'll just share that on my slideshow is produced by the National Police Council uh, and um, so this is all police chiefs representing uh, England Wales and Scotland uh, and it it shows you um, uh, the levels of uh, heroin and crack use within uh, England and Wales, and it's estimated to be between 300 to 350,000 uh, people, according to Public Health England. Actually, the, the true figure of that is much, much more, in, in, and that's the video right at the beginning shows you that many people live with hidden addiction. Um, according to the Crime Survey of England and Wales, 11% of the adult population, those between uh, 24 and 59 or 16 and 59, um, consumed a controlled drug at least once in a year. That's uh, 1.3 million people. Now 20, sorry, 20% 20 of 16 to 24 year olds consumed a controlled drug. That's 1.3 million people, so I've got my fa facts wrong there. Um, but that that's that's one in five young people who 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 regularly use a controlled drug and it just shows you the size of the of, of the drug using population just cannot be policed we have 140,000 police officers in England and Wales uh, and if, if and if 1.3 million people are using controlled drugs it's just impossible to police that number of people so our current policy policy of, uh, of prohibition is ineffective uh, because for those 1.3 million people the, the deterrent effect of prohibition has already failed because they're using controlled drugs. Uh, and, they, and that's the numbers of people who have um, uh, completed the survey in the first place. But it takes an awful lot of people to supply such a big market. And since 2012, there's been an over 20% rise, uh, sorry, 70% rise of young people being convicted of supplying controlled drugs. Um, that's, that's children aged between 10 and 17 ending up in prison uh, for supplying uh, a valuable commodity supplied by adults. Now, um, we have in the UK the highest number of drug-related deaths on record. And in fact, we have a third of all drug-related deaths in Europe. And if, to put that into some kind of context, that's three times the number of road deaths. And yet the, the, the story is, is, is a lot less publicised because of stigma. And in, in society, the public would have open outcry with that number of drug related deaths, for, um, sorry, road deaths, for instance, compared to drug related deaths. So in as an, an example of this, was it, which I use frequently, is in Barrow and Finesse, there were 12 drug related deaths in a, in a short space of time, um, all, all closely, uh, all, all within close proximity of, of each other. Now, if that had been road deaths, 12 in a very short space of time in the same location, the same stretch of road, that would have been national outcry. Uh, you know, millions spent in the redesign of that road, etc. But you don't see the same uh, for for drugs. Now, um, this infographic I won't play this because I want to save some time. But it essentially shows, and you're very welcome to these slides afterwards. Uh, Professor Harry Sumnall put together a, an infographic which shows uh, the drug trends over the past 20 years. It's fascinating to see, but it really proves that 16 to 24 year olds generally use stimulants. 
Now, for stimulant use, um, and correct me if I'm wrong amongst the experts in the room, but there is no pharmacological intervention at all for stimulants. It's all about psychosocial positive behaviour change. Now, for opiates, there is um, methadone, buprenorphine, dimorphine, for instance, but largely stimulant use, particularly in young people, it's about positive behaviour change. So then why do the police arrest people, particularly young people, for possession of drugs when we actually want to engage a positive outcome? So we've done exactly this in Thames Valley Police. So we no longer arrest anyone in possession of any substance at all. For young people, we have what's called a community resolution. I'll just skim round this, um, and it's a bit wordy just to save on time. But essentially, the community resolution negates the need for an arrest, interview, or even an admission of guilt. So when we find a person in possession of any substance, from crack to crystal meth to ca uh, cannabis or uh, an MPS, we now capture in a trauma-informed way that person's acceptance to go on to the scheme where the drug service take over from what would have previously been an incriminating encounter into a now positive health outcome. So within 10 minutes, the police are handing this issue of drug possession over to the experts in health. And we ask the drug service to contact that individual um, with their parent, guardian, et cetera, and the same for adults to conduct an assessment and, and a tailored intervention of education and harm reduction uh, for that young person. Because we know that we might find in the majority of cases, please find someone in possession of cannabis, but actually the, the, the risky use is around ketamine, for instance, at the weekend or cocaine once a month that their older brother brings. So it's the further risk and harm reduction that's the valuable intervention here. It's about knowledge. It's about informing young people of not just the risks, but also the harm reduction. So we acknowledge that drugs is a social uh, matter, I'm not going to say problem, but a social matter that requires a health-based approach. So afterwards, um, because bearing in mind the evidence around smoking, cessation, and, and, and the need for unlimited opportunities or frequent opportunities, this, this scheme itself has unlimited opportunities. So if you find someone again, uh, they can come round again and, and again enter into, into, into further uh, positive behaviour change interventions. Basically, we're leaving drug possession up to the experts. Now, you might wonder, well, how effective is that? If that's a voluntary scheme, there's no arrest, there's no threat of enforcement, well, how many young people actually go? And it's 88% over a six-week course. And over half of that 88% want to, want to come back or stay on beyond the mandated number of sessions. And on, on average, it's a six-week course designed by the experts. So we leave exactly the whole intervention design uh, and tailored approach to the experts, the drug service. The drug services can absolutely be trusted to provide the right kind of intervention for that individual, treating people as individuals. Um, for adults, uh, we tried the same scheme and we needed, uh, we had a nutrition rate which we needed to address and we needed a, a, a little more of a gentle nudge. So we asked uh, for a deferred summons. And that means that all, uh, all policing activity is uh, basically halted whilst that person makes that informed decision to go on exactly the same course. Uh, and 95% of all adults attended and completed that course and, and no prosecutions were, were ever followed up. So that the reach of this, just in Thames Valley, is, 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 is over 5,000 people a year. That's 5,000 people a year getting an assessment about what they're using, but also quality education and harm reduction as a result. And that's removing a significant number of people from the criminal justice system, but also significantly reduces stigma, which stigma largely is more harmful than drugs themselves. Now, naloxone, I'm uh, right at the end here, the last two slides. Um, naloxone is an opiate antidote. Most of the audience here will know. Um, it quickly reverses the effects uh, of um, opiates. Uh, an opiate and overdose uh, and um, as there's a national campaign on going uh, through the UK at the moment uh, which I mean this is lived experience uh, connecting with uh, people or their peers within marginalized communities about the effects and um, and 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 the the benefits of carrying naloxone and you can see the testament within the uh, the slide there for themselves um, carrying naloxone is easier than carrying your mate's coffin I mean, I think that sums it up exactly. But there's other, there's another quote here that really stands out and hits me. 
Now, I, I'd never heard of naloxone until it saved my life. We need naloxone everywhere. Naloxone is, is safe, it's effective, and it absolutely saves lives. Um, so why don't police carry it? So to build that upon the evidence base, we work with the ambulance service. Uh, this is just Thames Valley in Hampshire, a population of about 6 million. Um, and we asked the ambulance service how many times within the last year they administered, attended to an overdose on the street and administered naloxone. And as you can see there, it's over a thousand uh, incidents. And we've um, highlighted the most uh, uh, affected areas, if you like, for enhanced harm reduction within those areas. So we're approaching, we, we, we drilled down the data to areas of high footfall. So areas where uh, more homeless, homeless communities um, uh, uh, are populated. And um, we work with uh, the business sector uh, Timpsons, Greggs, within some of those locations to train their staff and, and, and be able to equip naloxone through the drug services. So it's cost neutral. The, the drug services have existing funding to provide naloxone uh, through peer groups, um, but also the businesses aren't affected, but they, they, they are the right people to, to have that within their, their premises. But also police officers. Police officers are, are absolutely the perfect uh, responders, if you like, to carry naloxone within those areas uh, of high harm, uh, and, um, and and I carry mine uh, with absolute pride. So that's the end of my presentation. It's a whistle-stop tour of, of what I've got. I mean, uh, following uh, uh, the, the, this panellist today is a real hard one to, to find a niche, but um, thank you for listening, and, and I'm very happy to share the slides and to, um, and, and to continue to support and definitely not punish. Thank you. Um, wow, Jason, not at all. Um, you followed the other panellists fantastically well and congratulations on the admirable work that you're leading out on in the Thames Valley. Um, and I love that um, tagline, support, not punish. Um, it's fantastic. And I know the drug deaths are absolutely shocking um, to hear the stats there in the UK. But um, I'm not sure that we're too far behind you here in Ireland. I know that our drug deaths are really high and they are absolutely definitely double if not triple our um road deaths numbers as well so um there lena saying i think we're higher okay so you know the the whole message about the police force carrying the lock zone i mean why not it's so simple anyone here that's done the training i mean it's 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 an hour training or something it's so short it's literally like an epi pen kind of a job <laughs> um, and so effective and reverses every overdose that it's used on i think the the research and the data on it is really positive so that's definitely another takeaway um jason thank you so much and i just love that whole idea about, you know, it can't be just left to the police either. Um, and in Tala, we're currently working on a proposal for a detached street work team to try and access the most vulnerable people and support them into services. Yeah, and I mean, if the guards could be supported to do that as well, wouldn't that be fantastic? Jason, thank you so much and congratulations again on the good work. Amazing. Um, so next we have Tony Duffin. Tony, for anyone that doesn't know, is the CEO at the Analyphy Drug Project. Um, Tony has led the Analyphy Drug Project successfully advocating for supervised injection facilities to reduce drug-related harm. And he's going to talk to us now about those safer injection facilities. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Neve. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. Um, it's a, it's a really sunny evening in Dublin, so people vote, vote, vote with their virtual feet, so it's good to see everybody still here. Um, and to follow Maria and Anna and John and Jason and to have, and, and to really on after me uh, is an absolute honour. I'm going to talk to you about um, an overview of safer injecting facilities and the helpful approach to the professional drugs for personal use. And it is an overview, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I would say that... Uh, um, it, just to follow Jason, actually, to, 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 I know Jason, and to follow a, a serving officer, Anna mentioned it in the comments, um, to hear a serving officer speak uh, with such compassion towards people who use drugs. I'm looking forward to the day when, when, when senior guards are able to talk in the same way. And I think it isn't that far off. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why. So um, this is, these are, just wanted to explain to you uh, why I want to talk to you about um, um, supervised injecting. 
Um, just to go back uh, to the reason why we're, we're, we're so, uh, it's so important to, to, to the Analyphi and to, to, to everybody now. Um, so we started, let me start lobbying for this and advocating for this back in January 2012. These images were taken um, uh, in Dublin in the last, well, that one on the left of my screen was with a tent there. That's just off of Henry Street. Um, and that was taken, I'm just thinking what day it is, Friday uh, last. Uh, the other one on the right is just off of Abbey Street and it was taken on about three weeks ago. I could have got photographs from Limerick or Cork uh, and shared them with you. Very similar scenarios, some of them even worse. This is where people are injecting amongst human excrement, blood, uh, urine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Street-based injectors, it says at the top, the practice of injecting drugs in public or semi-public spaces, in toilets, in, in restaurants, uh, restaurant toilets, in, in, in the island toilets, whatever, um, in day centres, that kind of thing. Um, but just to explain, I guess, um, if you or I go to a doctor uh, and want to get and, and we'll get an injection, you, you, you sit down, the nurse uh, lays everything out uh, in a very clinical, clean uh, fashion. You get your, your arm is cleaned and, and, and this mini surgery, as it was once described to me, takes place. This is nothing like that. And this is why we need uh, uh, supervised injecting in Ireland. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just, as, just in terms of uh, the volume, we, we would have talked about it at the beginning, back, back when we were advocating. Uh, we, we, we estimate around 400 instances of, of, of injecting going on in the city centre in any given week. Uh, um, you know, so pretty significant amounts of injecting going on. Um, one of the, just an interesting one, we went around in late 2016 and we undertook a, 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 a small project around drug-related litter, and we used that, we used phones, the geotagging, and we, and we tagged um, litter around, and in total, 57 separate incidents of drug-related litter were recorded, with over 1,750 individual pieces of litter being recorded as well over, over a two-week period. So, you know, it's very significant. Um, I'll, I'll show you what a, what a supervised injection facility looks like in a minute, but just for now, what... Um, Drug, a supervised injection facility is a drug consumption room or type it allows people to inject themselves with the drugs that they pre-obtained. It says in panel one there, they are harm reduction responses. They're a safe space to consume pre-obtained drugs whilst, uh, whilst monitored by trained under, uh, 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 under that's, all, that's all garbage, I don't know why, um, uh, by trained staff. Um, and then it's not there to encourage drug use. Okay, it, it doesn't, uh, nobody is inducted into drug use. This is a, uh, for a cohort of people who are established drug users. Um, they provide emergency care in the case of an overdose. Um, I was fortunate enough to work in one um, in 2015. And uh, I, during that two period, um, three people were saved from full blown overdoses, um, which was fantastic. Um, they get harm reduction advice. Uh, it's a safe environment. Sterile injecting equipment is given supervised supervision by trained staff, as I mentioned, referral uh, to, to appropriate services. Um, then three, they, they reduce uh, drug related deaths, reduce transmission of bloodborne diseases, increase public immunity, very important. You don't put these things, these services um, into areas where you don't have a problem with drug uh, based injecting, you, you put them into an area where you have a problem with the idea of reducing the drug related litter and the problem that, that uh, um, that, that uh, of street based injecting. So uh, you know, it, it helps reach a hard to reach cohort of people, very, very important. Harm reduction is about, you know, uh, interventions around needles and such and, and, uh, and uh, naloxone, as, as, as Jason mentioned and such, but it is about engaging with people and looking at healthy options for them and with them. Um, and gathers data on drug trends. So you can really, you can really pull things together. Um, uh, around the data that, that, uh, that, that on, on new drug trends. Um, and then, yeah, they're not new. Um, it's, it will be new to Ireland when we finally have one, um, but they are in Belgium, Portugal, uh, Denmark, France, Australia, Norway, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Canada. Um, so, yeah, so they're, they're, they're well established and well evidence based. Um, just going to run this for you and talk you through what it's like inside. This is a supervised injection facility in, in Sydney, in King's Cross. So what happens is people come into the reception area, uh, they go up to the counter there and they say, they're asked by a member of the team, they're registered, and they're asked for their, 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 their name and their password, and they uh, tell them what they're going to take, 
ask them what they had taken that day, and then they go through to the injector room. This is where people inject themselves, uh, doing something they were doing in the streets anyway. Um, very clean, everyone's encouraged to wash their hands, obviously. Uh, this is the nurse's uh, uh, desk uh, where they, people can get um, sterile equipment, and then they go over and inject themselves. Once they've used their drugs and prepared and used them, they tidy the things up and put them away in the clinical waste bins, and then they go through to the um, the aftercare area where where they will get um, support and referrals and such, a cup of tea, further monitoring. I would say that if it doesn't, when they're back in the in the injecting room, if it doesn't go well, that's where people are intervening, that, or even there actually. Where if someone starts to overdose, then then their, their intervention takes place uh, and their their lives are saved. Um, and it doesn't have to be a full-blown overdose. Uh, if someone's um, oxygen levels in their blood go below 95 on an oximeter, they, they will be put on oxygen because technically they're overdosing and that prevents them from going further. And that was just the back door there where people wandered out. I did go around that area. I looked around. I, I know where to look for um, drug-related litter. I didn't find any. Um, and I'm sure that's to do with that particular service and with the uh, municipality cleaning the place regularly as well, I'm sure of that. Um, but when I was there, the police force, uh, the, 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 the commander in the area, talked about his and their uh, supervising jet facility very much owned it. Um, and uh, when, when in, for example, in Lisbon, where they've had uh, legislation for about 20 years and weren't able to get theirs open, they opened up uh, recently a mobile uh, unit, and that's that's that one there. I can zoom in quickly just to show you how time is against me, but just to show you there, that's that's a mobile unit. That's what that would look like. And that, that can address issues of Indies and can park up in areas, can move away, can go where the where perhaps the drugs market has moved to. Um, oh, so uh, this is a slide, I'm not going to read through all this, but this is just to flag to you the, the kind of advocacy work that, that Anne Liffey and our colleagues and other civil society organisations engaged in uh, since 2012 and, and uh, bring this up to date there where, um, where, where uh, Merchants Key Island uh, won, won the, the tender for uh, the delivery uh, of the service and the published preview on the next slide, which uh, this was the, the Herald uh, headline is from 16th of December 2015. Um, and now to bring you up to date um, where we're at with the Medical Supervisor Injection Center, there's a, on, a judicial review on the 15th of June, which is, what is the night? so it's next week uh, the judicial review will be heard. Um, and having spoken to Paula um, Byrne recently, she was on a call with me, she mentioned that, uh, that, that, that they, would, they would expect a, a, a findings from, from the judicial review, um, a ruling around September, October time. So, so that's where we're at at the moment. Um, to move on quickly, I'm sorry about the time. Uh, it's been mentioned by Jason, a uh, health led approach has been mentioned by John that, that uh, you, you can't win this war uh, on drugs. Nobody talks about more than drugs anymore. Um, it's also been mentioned by Anna earlier that, that back, back in the early days, uh, the, the civil society groups would talk about addicts we care and pushers beware. And this quote uh, is from um, uh, the Dr. Dr. Aaron, it's, it's Charles Hall, he's quoted, it says, if we had to try to bring an, in legislation that would render, um, so we have had to try to bring, uh, to bring in legislation that would render certain acts punishable, but we have had to recognise that very often people committing these offences are not guilty of criminal activity in the normal sense, but perhaps are people who require medical care and attention rather than punishment. That was a debate about the Misuse of Drugs Act. 1977. They knew then um, it wasn't the intention uh, to, to have more people in prison, more drugs, more deaths. So um, I think that's really important just to reflect back on that and um, the discussion that Anna had earlier in the presentation. Um, brings us forward to July 2017, and, and this was the this was a picture I took because I was there at the at the launch of reducing harm, support and recovery, um, a, a health led. Um, a response to drug and alcohol use in Ireland. This is our national drug strategy. There's a review going on at the moment. Um, but this is uh, then T. Shopee of Radka, Ministers for Health, Simon Byrne, then Minister of Health, and, Minister, and then Minister for National Drug Training, Captain Byrne, etc. 
And uh, very clearly, the, the, the policy very clearly said that we would have a health that we really are to have a health that approach to the, 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 the possession of drugs for personal use. Um, and uh, just in terms of that, I would be hopeful that, that there will be an announcement soon, hopefully over the summer, around, because there's been much work in the background with public servants and civil servants um, working on this, a number of the working group uh, uh, previously, uh, a couple of years ago, and there's been a working group, uh, as well as a very focused working group looking at how the policy will be implemented. So hopefully we'll hear, we'll hear that soon. Um, and so, yeah, just a quick slide to, to capture it's all things that some of this already been mentioned, the Portuguese model, uh, it was called the Portuguese experiment, now it's turned into the Portuguese model. Um, and it's not a silver bullet, you need all sorts of treatment and rehabilitation uh, to go with it. Um, uh, but um, from a policy perspective, it's a much better option than prohibition. Um, and just to be clear, um, legalization is the regulation and control of, of substances uh, that are currently illegal. Uh, prohibition is the banning of those substances. Somewhere in the middle, the sweet spot is decriminalization. Um, and uh, that's, that's what Portugal has done, a diversion scheme essentially to divert people away into the health into, into the, the, the health system. Um, you can see there the benefits there around overdose and such. I would say that Ireland does have a very serious overdose rate, um, but we do count uh, uh, alcohol poisons in the pose as well. Um, so that's that's worth noting. But nonetheless, um, it, it is a very, we, we can look forward uh, in future years, and it will take many years to, to, to bring those, those numbers down, but, but, but uh, it's a better policy paradigm to be working with you. So I'm aware of the time, so I'm just gonna say thanks and you can always contact me afterwards. So thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, that was fantastic. And congratulations on, you know, getting the go ahead for the safer injection facility. And, you know, and even more so for hanging on in there when you have met so many speed bumps along the way. Um, and it's really reassuring to hear that there may be an announcement soon. So we'll be looking out for the update on that one. Thank you so much. And 44 years ago, that quote was in from the doll debate. That's unbelievable. Um, and I know looking at the Portugal picture, the thing that sticks out the most is the reduction in the drug related deaths. It's just massive. It can't be ignored. Um, so I thank you so much for that presentation. It was great. And best of luck with your continued hard, dedicated work that you do. I really appreciate it. Um, and last but not least, by no means least, um, we have independent, independent Senator Achana Dear Aaron representing Trinity College Dublin and a Tala native. Uh, Senator Lynn Ruan is going to give us some uh, roundup and closing comments and we're really, really grateful for her. And also before she starts, really grateful for helping me to pull this together as well. So thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Niamh. Um, so tonight, um, like I do with most events in relation to addiction or drugs or trauma, I usually kind of leave the, the Trinity piece or the Shannon Aaron piece to one side, because I think if, if, um, if anyone knows how trauma works, it means that you end up in conversations of things that affected your life for many years and you revert back to that trauma point in a second, you know? So I tend to not talk about, um, you know, unless I'm asked to present on decriminalization or the safe injecting sites or all of those things. And I think that's why tonight was so important because all the speakers I knew would um, amazingly put together that picture of where we are, where we need to go, what are the things we need to be talking about, you know, what are the learnings we need to have, how do we begin to challenge our own internalized classism sometimes or reinforcing that classism that has been imposed on us for so long. And I decided today to just kind of listen to the speakers and, and look at what comes up for me. And usually when we're talking about drugs or drug debts and that video, Jason, you should have put a trigger warning before it because straight away my PTSD or even my current situation, my heart was pumping. I could feel the veins in my neck moving. And that's what trauma looks like for me now, right? Now that's me in a very controlled trauma space where I can still sit here and I can still take it in and I can still speak. But 
going back to the very beginning and um you know marie you can c correct me because when i'm speaking about um trauma or dual diagnosis or bpd or anything else that anyone's ever experienced trauma in communities from poverty from inequality from watching your friends die you know burying four friends before you're 13 is not normal you know and it's akin to war zones in this relative space in terms of what you're actually experiencing on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis um, you know, to see an ambulance go down a road in their community, to see the guards, you ring your friends instantly. Not every community does that. You know, not everybody um, rings their friend's phone and then one, five minutes later, it's like they didn't answer. I'm going to knock into them. Are they all right? You know, because you know they relapsed. You know, it's like you're constantly in that panic mode. And so, so when Marie was talking about trauma and I was thinking about how people in services want to... I suppose, support people. And they talk about reaching the hard to reach groups. And I suppose what I was inspired to talk about then from listening to that was going, trauma doesn't look very nice, actually. And uh, it can look like aggression. It can be rage. It can be violence. It can be everything that you don't want to deal with as a worker. And then you further stigmatize and go, oh, do you know what? No, you know, they're just a little sorry for course and bollocks or they don't care or you know they don't want help or there's no hope for them and we start framing them right and put trauma to the side and I don't know what it is that we think trauma is it's not something pretty that's wrapped up and it's not submissive and it's not passive and it's not only presenting itself in a kind of low mood or a depression actually it's in your face chaos and chaotic and it is the young men on the streets, stone in the bus, in the middle of winter with a snow. It is that, like trauma is all of those things. And we can't just want to work with trauma when it's palpable to us and what we feel is, you know, easy to work with in a sense. And I think that that's what we need to be talking about is that those hard to reach people, those people that when they were young, where people we were concerned about, you know, we wanted to support their mother maybe because their mother was in addiction. Um, or then they were kids that might have needed support from Bernardo's. And then they hit a certain age where they tell you to go and F off. Who do you think you are telling me what to do? And then you go call the police. And it's like, how did we go from that young person being a person that has experienced poverty, inequality, trauma? Their parents have experienced poverty, inequality, trauma, and you can't separate parents from their own history. So you can't expect parents to become parents and all of a sudden know how to raise their kids to just traditionally make their way through education or service because they've never accessed them things. And, you know, so you're dealing with intergenerational cultural trauma that's shared in this big collective space in all of these communities, you know, and and then we look to justice to deal with that and it's kind of like like how does that make sense because you know i'm a politician now but as a drugs worker i want to know i'm good at my job which means i want to do my job i don't want the judge to do it so why would we promote a judge to do our job sure we might as well all just go home and allow the police <laughs> police the estates at that at that rate you know what i mean it's like there has to be a balance and you know it's it's for me, it's like there's so many different things we need to promote. I mean, uh, there was comments about, you know, uh, recovery and how we need to show people what recovery looks like. And that is that is that is so necessary and so needed. But we can't move away from asking the why. Why are we here? Why are we experiencing this? Why is that happening over and over and over again? And how do we address that? And we address that by not looking at sometimes the substance that we're using to cope and deal with this with our lives. We look at the reasons and we look at what's behind it. And we look at the systematic violence of policy on people. You know, I often look at my communities and the like drug users, I feel are my tribe. It's where I feel most safe. And I look at people framing people as not safe. And I find that really hard to comprehend in my head. And for me, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so hard to understand 
how we can look at overt violence in communities, right? And go, that's violent, you know, or they're killing each other or they're shouting at each other or that accent's a little bit, uh, you know, and we're afraid. And then we ignore the structural violence that's imposed day after day after day in communities. They're imposed by cuts to your services. They're imposed by people putting, inje- you know, injunctions on safe injecting sites. They're composed when we keep going on about like, you know, ring the guards because there's young men on scramblers in the park instead of someone going, do you know what, wouldn't it be great if we utilised the Tala Mountains and built a scrambler park and then we could work with them in the scrambler park and we could teach them how to look after their bikes, you know, but everything is like, call the police, call the police, call the police. And then when I remember when I met Jason first and, you know, I never thought I would say, oh, I'll just put you in contact with me friend, the copper, you know, I nearly had to go, is that a sentence coming out of my mouth? <laughs> Because I was my first introduction to violence was from the police. So our communities are said to be violent sometimes, and our young men can be said to be carry themselves in a very aggressive or violent way that people are afraid of. But I can tell you right now, my first experience and many of our first experience was that violence at the hands of authority. You know, and and in some cases, systems have taught us that. And in some cases, we're actually retaliating against that. And it's like, we need to talk about all of those things. And drugs is just one part of that. And we need to, we need to try and uncouple crime and drugs as if they're these two, you know, you know, I read so many articles like addiction and crime, you know, drugs and crime. Like, and it's like, can we not just talk about, you know, the why is like, why are people using substance to, you know, I use substance as a young person and recreationally, I use them because I enjoyed them actually and they were fun. But the ones that I took to subdue me, I took them to put me asleep. Now you have to ask, why does a 14 year old at two o'clock in the day want to be put asleep? You know, knock me out of the world. I don't want to die. I just want a little temporary holiday from whatever it is that's going on in my head. And so many of our young people are like that and they are the hard to reach, but they are the ones that are going to end up in the prison system. They are the ones that are going to end up with, you know, charges for drugs possession. And when they do ever want to go to college or if they do ever want to volunteer or if they do ever, because like my office deals with it every day around spent convictions and around drug charges. So we promote recovery, right? So you'll get a lot of people that go, we promote recovery, but we're not going to promote the fact that you shouldn't have a criminal conviction for the drugs that you were found with in your pocket. Now, those things don't go together because you don't get recovery in the true sense of the word if you're going to have convictions on your record for the rest of your life that never allow you to fully realize that recovery that we keep trying to sell you. You know, and they, 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 we have to have a, multi, a multidisciplinary approach to recovery and a health-led approach to addiction is part of that. It's very much part of that and it's not part of it. It means we only want you to recover in so far as on air outcomes at the end of the year, we can say you are drug free. But what happens to you from here on in and after that is none of our business. You know, and we can't do that. You know, it has to be a continuum of care right across the system. And we have to be able to support people to build a life that they deem worth living, not that we deem worth living. And that's not always abstinence. It's whatever they feel that they can live with in their day and we need to facilitate and support that. So I'm just I'm just very grateful, I suppose, Neve, that like you put on tonight's event. I think um, I think it's a long time since Tala have had real conversations around, um, you know, where it wants to go and moving out of the past. And I think we need to be able to challenge ourselves and we need to be able to look to the future and we need to be able to offer people a real solution for the lives that they're, that they're living and the lives that they're in and we need to be creative now I, in saying that it's very hard to be creative when you know you're not resourced enough to think even for a moment in that creative space because you're trying to you know fill out a million forms and seeing people as economic inputs and outputs and you know having to account for everything in your service and that takes away from the work and I think we haven't mastered that properly because the more we spend doing that the less we spend doing the work whatever that is and so I just think like I think all the speakers tonight are really you know they're really moving towards and I think you know people in the comments box made some good points around like this idea of 
um, what is health led and does that mean pharma and it doesn't you know and I think we like people will be afraid of medicine and pharma and we need to not allow the systems that we're fighting against to reframe what health is to us because <laughs> health is actually positive health health can be taking a walk health can be you know a peer support group health can be trying to address the environmental factors that lead to such a high rate of comorbidity in our communities you know health can be social prescribing you know you like looking at someone who's living in isolation who's drinking every night because of that isolation and looking at what else do they need that's a health-led approach you know it's not about medicine it's not about pharma so i think when we talk about what a health-led approach is everyone's already doing it every day in their work and it's about us owning that promoting that and saying fund that because we believe in improving people's health in in in, in every context and yeah, so I, I, I'll stop there because like I said, you know, I get a trauma response in these moments. So right now you're getting a very, a very, um, very much healed Lynn trauma response, <laughs> but it's still a trauma response as soon as we talk about drugs. So Niamh, thanks very much for having me on tonight and, and uh, well done. Lynn, thank you so much for articulating, I think what we all, know instinctively we know that about trauma because it makes sense and you know when you talk about wanting to be out of your head I mean if young people want to be out of their head more than they want to be in their head you know we need to look at that and ask why um, and I just I don't think I can say anything to top what you said there um, and I think the other speakers will agree that it was good to keep you last <laughs> um, but it was so emotive and I thank you for being so real and raw and sharing your personal experience and um, you know we're all so proud of you in Tala so thank you for all of the work that you do um, you know which is not always the wind is not always going in your direction you know you're often going against it and you never give up so we appreciate well, as it a working, as a working class as working class and a woman I'm used to fucking running into the wind <laughs> <laughs> and I love that you still course as well um so listen I, I I just want to wrap up it's we've about eight minutes to go and um there was lots of really good chat in the comment box if anybody was following it um, there was some questions, um, but a lot of them were answered as we went along. Thankfully, there was it, there was good engagement. Um, there was one there in relation to what Jason was presenting on. So I might ask that, but then I might just ask each speaker, if you don't mind, to make some closing comments, if that's OK. Um, but Jason, there was a really kind of a practical question there about how local services in Thames Valley responded to the significant increase in referrals that they got. And I think that that's a really good question because, yeah, you're saying 5,000 people a year were diverted to services. So that's it. That's a, a realistic question, I think. And the, the second part of it was, you know, how do people respond to police providing overdose intervention, you know, when they may have... Um, a negative experience of authority. Um, and I think we may have answered that in relation to being trauma informed. Um, but if you had any comments on that, and then we might ask the other speakers to just make comments as well. Not yeah, on that thanks. particularly, but whatever they want. Thanks, Jason. Thank, thanks, Neve. And, and, and thank you for, for having me. And, and um, yeah, following uh, Senator Ryan is, 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 is really difficult. She's awesome. A really, really advocate. A really, I mean, there's no advocate for people quite like her. Um, yeah, so much respect. Um, so, um, yeah. So, how was drug diversion funded uh, for for children? I'll start with the easiest bit. For children, young people, there are statutory uh, pathways already in existence. Um, they were cost uh, neutral to police, so the 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 they are funded through children's social care budgets. Um, there were pressure points on some young person substance misuse providers. Uh, but we work with them to absorb the extra pressure points and to work with them. But essentially, the funding is already there uh, for young people. They're statutory. Um, no agency will turn away a young person under 18 for any health matter whatsoever. Uh, that's the system we have. Um, for adults, it was slightly different. The local drug services, uh, so we're talking four and a half thousand people across Thames Valley per year. Uh, so for an area like Milton Keynes, that would have been 70 people a month. Uh, that was quite an intensive addition, uh, uh, bulk of work. So we uh, uh, conducted some cost analysis. Uh, we found that within Thames Valley, it would save about a million pounds a year, a non-cash savings uh, for diversion. 
so we were able to offset some of that to uh, to to fund uh, the adult drug services. Um, so uh, that's how the funding is done. Uh, turn to um, just to just before turning to, to naloxone, uh, we've we've also the, the drug diversion scheme leaves no criminal footprint. Uh, behind either. So it's uh, not quite decriminalisation, I wish it was, but we're not quite there, but it's instantly available within the, co the current legal context. The community resolution outcome is an absolute golden nugget of legislation, um, which also enables schools to utilise diversion uh, instead of exclusions. Uh, so we've enabled the schools to use diversion instead of contacting police. Uh, to prevent kids from uh, being excluded and so on. Uh, for naloxone, uh, so Thames Valley Police had a, a take-home naloxone programme anyway for uh, detainees in police custody, uh, for those at risk. Uh, we've also got a, a needle exchange programme just about to be uh, launched quite soon, hopefully, with self-dispensing needle packs and naloxone packs for detainees leaving at, say, for instance, 2am when you know they're going to score and at risk of overdose. Uh, but also um, uh, police training, that's that's something that's in the pipeline now the national police council are writing a joint letter with the police federation of england and wales on their joint position but it's something it's going to be something like this that police officers can carry naloxone be supported uh, by the police federation as long as it's done on a voluntary basis and trained and equipped by the drug services uh, so it's um, again a fully a partnership approach um but that, that's it but happy to um, for anyone to email me and I can, I can work with them on, on any of that. Thank you, Jason. And I saw that you did put kindly put your email address in the chat box. So if anybody wants to quickly scroll back there, they will find Jason's email address if they need more information. And that's very kind. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm sure as we're having a look at the chat box as we were going along as well. So if you wanted to maybe speak to any of the comments, great, or else um, just give us your, your own closing comments. And maybe we'll just go in order of how I see people on the screen. So maybe Tony will come to you first. If you just Thank, want you. Me Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, look, that if, if anyone's any doubt about health-led approach or the version scheme, it's not a get out of jail card. Um, just to explain that, that if someone does something that is violent or they steal something or whatever, they, that, that gets dealt with in the criminal justice system. Um, it's just that the uh, possession of drugs is dealt with as a health, a health, a, a health issue. Um, and if you think about it, if you're willing to keep sending people to prison over and over and over again with very little return, and you hear something like Chase has just described, then we should be willing to keep trying with people and keep giving them every opportunity. If it's a, a health issue the first time, it's a health issue the hundredth time. Um, so yeah, that's, that was just a thought at the end of all this. And it was a really, really, really interesting uh, evening. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Anna, if I can come to you next. Uh, thanks, Niamh. Yeah, and it's, I, I'd, almost, I'd almost like find it hard to know what to say because the, the the discussion and the conversation it's just been so it's just been so wonderful to be part of a, an honest open discussion um where people people can say what they think they can say the things they think are positive the things they think are working not working can and I just think we, we, we've got and well done Niamh, and well done to Tala Drug Task Force for having <laughs> We have to start doing this everywhere. We get we have to build momentum from the ground again for having these kind of discussions. Like they haven't been happening. And so like discussions been closed down. Um and it's yeah, it's, it's none of what we none of what we want to achieve is is going to be um, I'm actually getting emotional, which is ridiculous because it's it's so it's so difficult to be operating in a space where discussion is closed down, where expression of views is not supported or encouraged. And I, so I just think, I just think more, there has to be more of this, you know, <laughs> there has to be more spaces where people can have discussions like this. Um, because we have to build up that, that, um, that space again, and that voice where people can, can be honest and express their views, not because they want to be difficult, not because they want to give out, but because they want to 
share their experience. They want to have an influence on our policy so they can work, so we can improve things for people. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm getting emotional, but it's it strikes me that it's so rare now to have this kind of a discussion and it shouldn't be like that. And so we just have to keep having more of them, do you know? Yep, so well done. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Anna. And look, I like I get emotional as well um, because we're compassionate. So don't ever lose that. Thanks, Anna. Marie, can we come to you next? Yeah, I'll try and be quick. Um, I, um, I think I'm also getting emotional. And I think, you know, like Lynn's saying, and I think a lot of, you know, is our all, all our trauma responses. Uh, hopefully, I'm also coming from a more healed uh, reaction uh, now. But what I was just wanted to say was that a lot of, you know, coming from a psychiatric perspective, um, you know, there's, and, and knowing that there's a lot of people out there, professionals in, in, you know, working within our services in the mental health services in particular, I guess, is from where I was coming from and um, who, who are traumatized by the systems themselves. And there's a lot of healing needed, um, you know, and, and I, I do worry a little bit about the same thing around that the health approach being hijacked I guess by the biomedical model uh, as as a means of, of securing funding um because I, I know that a lot like I know um psychiatry only only needs things like that to sort of hold on to as like that's it health-led approach equals um you know, this is what we need, um, you know, in, in medical interventions. And, you know, so I, I, I fear that. Uh, so I think it's great to keep, keep, uh, keep, um, keep informing or, uh, uh, you know, around what a health led approach is in terms of not um, being medicalized. And I think like that from a mental health perspective, I know a lot of, you know, working within the community now, you know, so many people are saying, well, if only I can get on the, you know, if only I get the right diagnosis with the right medication, then that's what I needed, needed as opposed to, you know, um, you know, being stuck in addiction. But, but that's not necessarily, you know, we need to kind of keep going further than that, because we need to also have reform of our mental health services to become more trauma informed and understand that it's not about just, you know, um, finding the right diagnosis and finding the right medication that certainly doesn't solve any problems you know it, well I mean of course there's a lot of people who need need that and it's part of it but but that it, it needs to um it needs to be trauma informed across across the board in terms of our communities I think it's the only way forward you know and, and I and I'm pleased to say that there are you know things are shifting you know there there is um different conversations now even you know than early in my career and I'm not around that long <laughs> anyway thanks a million for this great event Nathan, and to all the speakers who are brilliant um listening to you all thank you so much Marie um thank you for those comments and I think that um you know it's just admirable with all your hard work that you do basis that you're still willing to you know give over an evening to talk about this topic as well. So it's really, really appreciated. Um, John, can we come to you, please? Sure. Yeah, I think, I guess to, to echo what's been said, but also I think all of all of the co-speakers uh, uh, know, I think what I'm gonna say is that if COVID, well, if COVID has shown us anything, right, it's global, global problems need local solutions. You can't, there's no, no communities in Ireland, no countries in Ireland, you know, really, right? We're, we're all interdependent on these things. But what we learned in drug policy is little changes in very specific locations can reverberate around the, the world. And I think that goes to the point that's being said is we need more of these local discussions. We need mo more of these local um, models or experiments or, 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 or case studies or, or, you know, positive stories coming out where communities have, have, have taken better, uh, stronger approaches to this and have really dealt with it or tried to, to correct the issues and, and deal with the challenges. And I think those can have an impact at the international level. And I think we, Tony, Tony Anna in particular, I know because we were part of a lot of these discussions when we were talking about the safe injection sites and decriminalization, that people want to see good cases. People want these kind of success stories. And I think Ireland has provided that in the past. And I think it is exciting to, 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 to think of the possibility that it will continue to be that in the future. So yeah, that, that would be my thoughts. Thanks, John. And, you know, just to say that um, there was like 
almost 100 people joined the session this evening, but there was actually another 100 people registered who were unable to make it this evening and are going to receive a recording of the session. So in it, that, that event only went live in the last couple of weeks. So I think that shows the interest and the desire to do things a little bit more progressively. So thanks for that, John. Um, Lynn, do you want to add anything? Have you anything left <laughs> after your fantastic words? I didn't, was that me? You, you said that. Yeah, name. sorry, Lynn, just if you wanted to say anything to finish. Yeah, no, I just think, you know, I, I think we need to accept that the evidence is there matched with the lived experience that Anna talks about and the community knowledge, the institutional knowledge, uh, like the evidence is all there for all the different approaches we've talked about from, from, from trauma to dual diagnosis and um, to health led policies. And it's about now just not being afraid of change and, you know, acknowledging that we've done things for a particular way for a long time. Yeah, trauma is increasing mental health diagnosis is increasing, addiction is increasing. So like at some stage you have to go, you have to be able to accept that how you've done things for 10 and 20 years is no longer, you know, so I think there's sometimes a fear, a fear in us to acknowledge that maybe how we've been doing things is not working because then we have to address something in ourselves about how we, how we do things. And I think it's one of the biggest failures of politicians to not be, you know, to not be able to change tact, you know, like to let go of a policy. It's like, you know, you know, we'll keep standing over this policy and just convince everyone else that they're doing it wrong, you know, and it's this real gas lighting on a national scale of people that will hold on to policies that don't really work. And I think we need to be very careful then as people working in communities that we don't hold on to things um, that are not working and that actually we welcome and embrace change and how we do things. So, I mean, that would just be all I'd finish with, that the evidence is there. We just need to embrace change and not be, yeah, yeah, not be afraid to, to change our minds on how the work should and needs to be done in terms of working with people and their lives. Thank you so much, Lynn, and everybody again, thank you. I don't know if you can see the comments coming through, but they are all so, so positive from thanking the speakers to saying that they're inspired to move into Thames Valley. <laughs> Jason, your, your, your population has just increased. Um, so listen, thank you so much. I know we've ran slightly over time, so I do apologize for that, but I don't think anyone would argue that it wasn't worth the extra seven minutes. Um, I'm delighted that we, we had Ali here making sure everything was running smoothly in the background and the recording and all of that. So that will be sent out to you if, you, if you're registered, which you are, because you're here. So um, you'll have that to look back on if you missed any bits. I know I will certainly look back over it as well. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely evening. And I hope to see you all again in the future. Thank you. <laughs>